Hello, my name is Chase Houghton, and I am in 11th grade, and I go to Sarasota High School. And our scripture passage today comes from the second chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning with the 13th verse. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at the tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will ra you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this and he believed and they believed that the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Chase, thank you, Chase, for reading the scripture. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Before I start the sermon, I want to compliment Bill, Ma Bill Mallet. I see purple candles there in Lenten season, and I like to compliment Pastor Lori too. And also, more importantly, I noticed there were six purple candles some weeks ago. Every week on Sunday, you took away a purple sun a candle. So that means we have two more weeks in Lent, right? Two more Sundays in Lent. Four? It's supposed to be six, so, hmm, are we? Oh, this is number three, so four, five, six. We're missing one. <clears throat> oh, well, compliments anyways. It's all Bill Mallet's fault, I know. So, <laughs> It's really always fun to tease Pastor Lori and Bill Mallet. So speaking of teasing, my husband, Will Brown, many of you know who he is, is 12 years older than me. Most of the time, that is a comfort for me. I value his experience, accomplishments as a pastor, and places he has been as a church leader I also enjoy most of the time being his wife for 25 years. <laughs> I love that Will loves my huge, big family. Even if he and they don't speak the same, the same language, he loves them and they love him. My family, when I take Will home and we get together, is like my big fat Greek wedding. How many of you have seen it? It's an old movie, younger one of you will not, may not have seen it. So my family loves him and they, they, put, they pull tricks on him just like in the movie and they taught him wrong words for wrong meanings and make fun of him and they spoil him silly, they love him as much as he loves them. But other times I wonder, why did I marry this older guy? Well, of course, I know I did fall in love with him and he with me. Sometimes I do wonder, only God knows why. We dated for only four times, believe it or not, before I accepted his marriage proposal. So 12 years older, Will retired a few years back during that time, each day I came home and my house was a big mess. He is a quiet, brilliant man, but you know, having dated a man four years only and you both worked the whole time, 
I didn't know that he was also a champion at making a mess in a whole big house, really fast. So each day I would come home from work and I would say, Willie, that's what I call him, let's organize the house together. And so we would do that every day. Um, then I tolerated that routine for about a year and a half. One day I came home after working a very, very long day. The house was a real big mess. And I said to my husband, Will, that's what I call him when I'm serious. Will, go back to work. <laughs> well, I couldn't have said anything better to him than that, it turned out. So shortly after that, he went back to work. He was really happy. And then um, he actually looked 10 years younger and behaved 10 years younger. So he still today is not a good cleaning uh, kind of a guy or organizing the house on his own initiative. Thank God he can do it when I say, let's do it together. So we clean the house together still, probably will be the rest of our lives. When we lived up north every year about this time of the year, we clean outside the house seriously, preparing for the flowers such as crocuses and daffodils to come up the ground and bloom. We cleaned up inside our homes, going through um, the closets, looking at clothing and shoes, and determining which ones we haven't used in a long time. So we can pile them out and donate them out to people who might be able to use them. Of course, we did the same kind of cleaning in the summer and in the fall. I grew up in a home where serious cleaning happens every night before going to bed. No dirty dishes in the sink overnight, ever. I love living in cleanliness and order. Disorder gives me claustrophobia. The story in the Gospel, according to John chapter 2, that Chase has read to us a little bit ago, is an historical event. Jesus cleaned the temple in Jerusalem with all seriousness. Jesus did not approve of animals, birds, merchants, money changers in the temple. In the context of the time, the temple cleaning that Jesus had done, the temple was the main and necessary way people worship God and connected with God. Just before Jesus cleaned the temple, he performed his first miracle, turning water into wine at a wedding in Cana at a private home. Professor Joes Basler says, in the preceding episodes, Jesus changed water into an abundance of wine, a miracle that evokes memories of the prophets Elijah and Elisha. Quietly performed in the private setting of a Galilean wedding, this miracle revealed Jesus' glory, at least to his disciples who, as a consequence, believed in him. When Jesus got to the temple in Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem, according to our scripture, things were not as he wanted them or expected them to be. Professor Hewitt Glower tells us that on entering the temple precincts, Jesus found little in the way of sacred space. The court of the Gentiles looked and sounded like an open air market. Kettle bellowing, sheep bleating, turtle doves cooing, people yelling, coins clanging. Strangely, the temple shuckles, the temple used shuckles in those days from the city of Tyre for the temple currency, thus the need for money changers in the temple. Jesus saw that the temple needed a good cleaning. Merchants have created conveniences for themselves and for the pilgrims who come to worship there. Buying and selling animals, birds, in the temple made it convenient for the, camp the pilgrims who come to worship from all over the places. 
It was much easier for the pilgrims to buy animals or birds from home and bringing them with them to the temple on a journey. And it was even easier to come to Jerusalem first and go to the marketplace, buy animals or birds or both to bring them to the temple to worship. So they made it very, very convenient. The temple needed cleaning because the law governing the temple had been broken. According to Professor William Berkeley, Jesus was reminding the Jews of their own laws. In his time, Jews thought so little of the sanctity of the outdoor court of the temple that they used as a Torah face on their business errands. Jesus was angry at the exploitation of the pilgrims. He was angry at the discreation, discreation of God's holy place. Jesus talked about destroying the temple and rebuilding it in three days. He was not talking about the physical temple in Jerusalem where he was cleaning, but he was talking about his own body as the temple of God. Dr. Herman Wagen writes, Jesus is now presented to the implied reader as the new temple of God. Indeed, the living temple of God was Jesus, his body. Whether Jesus goes, he will fulfill the functions of God's temple. The physically glorious temple in Jerusalem could not have survived without the temple text from the people, just like we need to give our, uh, we need to give to God, to the church, to maintain our entire campus. As Pastor Sarah was telling us, last Sunday we have celebrated love, life, celebrate, and celebrating our gifts to God. I believe the gospel writer John had a purpose in retelling the story in his own day. By the time he wrote that, I said that because by the time he wrote this part of the story, the temple in Jerusalem that Jesus was cleaning was already destroyed. Animal sacrifice and worship was no longer a part of religious practice. Worship, in, worship among them have shifted to at homes as well as in the synagogues. This story of Jesus Cleaning the temple can teach us for our own time, here and now. We can learn about the inner cleaning or cleansing we all need. We are in the middle of Lenten season in which we remember, and some of us, many of us, practice praying along with Jesus for 40 days and 40 nights plus six Sundays. Jesus was praying and fasting in the wilderness um, most of us are not in the wilderness. We reflect, examine, and reform our lives during this time in our homes and wherever we live. We get to deep clean our hearts, our minds, and our souls by reflecting, by praying, and by repenting from our sins. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, our bodies are the temples of God where the Holy Spirit lives. We are to keep our bodies, minds, and souls clean and holy, worthy of God's dwelling. Regardless, the God we worship in us dwells with us. I should re-say that. Regardless whether we keep our bodies, minds, and spirits clean, the God we worship lives in us because we are the temples of God. According to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, each and all of us are created by God in God's own image and likeness. Therefore, we do have the power to keep our bodies, our minds, and our souls clean. We can ask for God to help us when we need help. God, in God's grace, and mercy will always help us. Today is not just an ordinary first Sunday of the month. 
Today is the third Sunday in Lent. In Lent, we remember Jesus praying and fasting, as I mentioned a bit ago, in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. We observe Lent in many ways to reflect, to repent, and to get cleaned or renewed. Trappist monk, one of the Trappist monks that I follow, the greatest said, the greatest need of our home the Trappist monk Thomas Martin, you see his picture on the screen, said the greatest need of our time is to clean out the enormous mess of mental and emotional rubbish that cluttered our minds and makes all political and social life a, ma a mass illness. Without this housekeeping, we cannot begin to see. Unless we can see, we cannot think. One of the ways I get my personal inner um, self clean is walking a labyrinth. We have a beautiful labyrinth that you see on the screen right over there by the campus center. I mean, by the Palm Center. So I would actually walk a labyrinth quietly alone with God. That opens my mind, my heart, and I sometimes can hear God and what God is saying to me. Not often that I hear, but also not often. Sometimes as I walk slowly, I find myself talking to God, the God that is always there, always listening, and always hearing. I find myself talking to God. Even if it is just a silent and quiet time or walk with God, like walking labyrinth is like feeding my soul, cleansing my spirit. You know, we just sang a song, just a little talk with Jesus. Well, that's what you get to do when you're walking labyrinth sometimes. I invite you to walk this beautiful labyrinth that we have right there. It's open all the time. Thomas Merton also said, love is our true destiny. We do not find the meaning of life by ourselves alone. So I invite you to continue to worship together, here or there or anywhere. Because God has created us not to be little alone islands, but to be in a community of faith. In a few minutes, we will gather at the Lord's table right here to receive the elements which are the signs of forgiveness of our sins. By the grace of God, through the sacrament of our, the Lord's Supper, as we eat the bread, as we eat the bread of life and drink the cup of salvation, we will be clean once more, body, mind, and spirit. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. We're most grateful, O oh God, for loving us all the time and listening to us all the time. Teach us to clean our body, mind, and soul by talking, having a little talk with Jesus every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.